Welcome to Your Daily Detroit, recorded on Wednesday, May 22nd, 2019. I'm Sven Gustafson. And I'm Jer Stays. On today's show, Jefferson Chalmers on Detroit's east side is getting millions of dollars for neighborhood improvements from Roger Penske. A new ride-sharing service is launching that aims to bridge the gap of our region's inadequate mass transit. The city of Detroit could get more than 60 new liquor licenses. And a Detroit charter school funded by tennis star Andre Agassi is suddenly closing. So let's dive right in after a word from a sponsor. Daily Detroit is brought to you in part by Milo. Milo is a marketing agency that produces amazing experiences for audiences. They partner with their clients to drive business and create innovative content. Do cool stuff with them at Milo.agency. When we heard that we could get together and and be a part of this uh, strategic fund, uh, uh, we said, let's go see it. So we came here, and it was really, to me, a place I'd never been. To be honest with you, that's amazing. I would have to say that today, knowing my been in Detroit quite a while. But this gave us a real opportunity to show the community that we want to give back. That's the voice of businessman Roger Penske. He also led efforts around the Super Bowl when it was in Detroit back in 2006, and he organizes a little thing called the Grand Prix over on Belle Isle. Jer, uh, you went down to this event in the Jefferson Chalmers neighborhood this morning. He was there, Mayor Mike Duggan, other officials. What's going on over there on the east side? Yes, Sven, the city rolled out another neighborhood to get corporate support through their big neighborhood strategic fund project. This time, remind, remind us what that's about again. That's So there is a variety of dollars being made to targeted neighborhoods around the city. Usually in each neighborhood, there's kind of like a key corporate partner along with others to kind of drive improvements, whether it's through parks, uh, providing loans, streetscapes, streetscapes, uh, improvements. Also, sometimes I've heard about non-monetary support where it's people power as opposed to money like expertise. So in Jefferson Chalmers, it's $5 million spearheaded by Penske to fix up the Lenox Community Center. They're going to add a gymnasium and uh, they're also going to add some lighting to AB Ford Park, which, by the way, I think is a totally underrated, underloved park in the city. It's got a lot of potential. It's right on the Detroit Riverfront there. Yeah, I played soccer there. It's a beautiful park. Fun little fact, they still have missile guidance systems left over from the Cold War sitting there like mushroom cement things. They're really cool. Mm -hmm. Anyway, uh, and then on top of that, the uh, feds are going to be through the EPA kicking in some money for wildlife preservation. That's interesting. All right. So uh, remind our listeners, where is Jefferson Chalmers? So that's the area of Detroit that's nestled right there at the corner of Gross Point Park. It's kind of right on the Detroit Gross Point border. Think the riverfront, think a little bit past Jefferson, that whole area, Alter in Jefferson, goes kind of down to, in my mind, I think kind of spreads down to where the Jefferson North Assembly plant is at. Yeah, and there's a little business district there um, with some pretty cool old buildings and stuff. And one of my favorite dive bars in Marshalls, which is right along the canals there, which is totally underused. I mean, it's like the Venice of Detroit, and yet it's not a thing. <laughs> Sounds so nice, the Venice of Detroit. There are things that are starting to happen over there, but it's still like super early days. And Duggan, for his part, is very excited about the area. And when Roger and Bud and I were talking about where would you go, I said, I want you to check out a neighborhood you probably never heard of that I think is one of the most special and unknown neighborhoods in Detroit. And that's Jefferson Chalmers. To me, it's amazing beautiful housing, open spaces and land where there used to be houses, a river at the south end, a commercial district that's very underdeveloped at the north end, uh, abandoned apartment buildings that need to be renovated. I said, you want to talk about an area that has the potential to come back enormously and has never had the resources. So what's the timetable on all this, Jer? Well, they're saying the community center will be ready in September of 2020. Uh, There is a lot of work to be done. Sure. Uh, We've talked with Josh Elling from Jefferson East. That's the uh, community development uh, nonprofit over there before on this podcast. That was all about all the things going on over there, of which there are a lot. We'll put a link in the show notes to that episode because that's worth a listen. But it seems like that's maybe the next, you know, area of big focus in the in the city that's really going to pop. It's in a great location next to a lot of available dollars in the gross points. And this is the kind of thing with this strategic investment by Penske that gets things like really moving in earnest. I mean, the event was at Norma G's, which is a great little restaurant in an old bank building. We've been trying to get over there for a while and, uh, you know, discovered they're not open for lunch, unfortunately for us. But it was a very cool spot. I could see why it's starting to gain traction. 
you need dollars and you need focus. And that's something, frankly, the city over the last like 20 years hasn't done very well. And they, the strategic they had, plan. They haven't had dollars. They haven't had dollars or focus, neither, neither thing. And this strategic framework is starting to make uh, some moves in different communities. For Jefferson Chalmers, this means this could include like grocery stores down the line. I actually saw renderings of what it would be like to have a grocery store right there across from the Vanity Ballroom, which is over there, which is also a very cool spot. Yeah. And I hope something happens with it. Recently, it was named a National Historic uh, Preservation Trust neighborhood. That was something that was pretty big news. And just a bit ago, we talked about that pair of historic buildings that are getting renovated Apartment right buildings. there. Yep. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So things are starting to move. Yeah, it'll definitely be interesting to watch. A lot of potential in that neighborhood, but a lot of needs there, too. I mean, that's, you know, especially if you go north of Jefferson, that neighborhood is in very dire need of some basic services and, you know, some stabilizing, frankly. One side effect of Detroit's corporate boom is that parking downtown is getting a lot harder for people who work in the city. The head of Blue Cross Blue Shield in the past has said that you can't lease a parking spot for employees anymore as there aren't any available. Bedrock is busing employees from lots around town into the core of the city. And reliable mass transit across the region isn't any closer to being a reality. It's no longer even in the wider conversation with the attention now being paid to fixing the roads. So would you use an app that let you come and go when you needed to and carpool to work? Bedrock's companies, owned by Dan Gilbert, have linked up with a company called Scoop to bring it to Detroit. On the line with me from San Francisco is Rob Sadow. He's the CEO and co-founder of Scoop. So what exactly is Scoop? Sure. Scoop is an enterprise carpooling solution. We work with you know, large employers across the country to make it possible for their employees to share trips back and forth to the office, uh, improving their quality of life and reducing vehicle trips. And we're very excited to, to move into Detroit, the first major market off the West Coast. One of the things that I find really interesting about this is that in Metro Detroit, compared to uh, some other cities like the, the Bay Area, Seattle, we actually don't have that great of a mass transit system here. It's if you're going too far, it's it's not really a reliable way to to get around. So how how what is the service area for what you're you're serving and kind of like how big is the footprint going to be when you get started? Sure. So we built Scoop with with that fact, the fact that a lot of the country doesn't have access to public transit uh, with that particular commuter in mind. Our main focus is people that are historically driving five miles or 10 or 20 or 50 miles each way every day, don't live on a transit line and are stuck driving alone uh, and not having a great experience doing that. And how do we offer a Scoop as a carpooling and technology solution to make it possible for those commuters to be able to share trips uh, back and forth to the office in a way that's flexible and still works for their, for their day and schedule? And frankly, it came from my own experience growing up. I grew up in Atlanta. My brother is my co-founder. We grew up in Atlanta. And when I was in high school, my commute was 25 miles each way, and there was no public transit line to take me back and forth. And so you know, my first experience was being 16, driving 250, 300 miles a week, and understanding what that feels like for your day, your energy level, your stress. And that's what we really focus on as a company is how do we solve that experience for, for everyday commuters. So looking at the materials, one of the things I noticed now, it has a series of zip codes that's available. Is that zip codes, and for listeners to note, they're mostly seeming to be in like the central business and greater downtown area close to the city core. Is that in and out of those zip codes? How does that kind of whole thing work? So those are the areas where you can take trips into, meaning that if you work in those zip codes, you work in those areas, Scoop is now available to you to use to get back and forth. You can take trips originating from anywhere in the area surrounding. And so you know, quite often we'll see commuters taking trips from even as far as 50, 60, 70 miles away to share trips into those areas. And any time that we open in a, new, in a new market or location, we think about that first radius as the starting point. And then we focus really aggressively on how do we expand so we can support more commuters and communities. And so you know, the Scoop team is focused on building relationships with more employers in the area, continuing to expand the footprint in which we operate. 
And if you're outside of that area, but want to bring Scoop to your employer, we'd love to have that conversation with you or your employer to make sure that we can make that happen. So listeners are clear, this works specifically with employers who have signed up for this service. This isn't necessarily like Lyft or Uber, where you can open your app and anybody can grab a ride right now, right? So so the way that it works, and one thing to clarify is that there's no hired or contracted drivers. These are all coworkers and neighbors sharing trips. And so the way that we approach it is we always start in any market, we anchor around an employer. What we do is we focus on building programs, a managed carpool program around employers, but we'll also allow commuters in the surrounding area to participate up into a level. And once you get to a certain level, you have to have an enterprise program to continue to scale it. And so we do that to engage the broader community, to make sure that we can make this available and allow people to have a first experience with Scoop and understand why it'd be valuable for them bringing it to their employer. But the core thrust of the business where we spend our energy is actually building employer programs to then continue to support and improve quality of life across broader communities. So how does that process work for a prospective rider or sharing driver? So anytime that you want to take a trip, it's totally based on your schedule. So if you want to take a trip with Scoop, you give us a few basic inputs, like where are you coming from? Where are you going to? What time you want to take that trip? And you can be specific like 7 a.m. or you can give a range like 7 to 8 a.m. And if you want to drive or ride, and you can choose that every trip. Some people choose to drive one day, ride the next. Some people will only drive. Some people will only ride. So every time you want to take a trip, you tell us that information. We'll get thousands or tens of thousands of those requests. And we'll solve for what's the most efficient way to get everyone from home to work or work to home on that particular trip. One of the things that's particularly impactful about that is that because the trips are booked one way at a time, it actually gives you a lot more flexibility and control of your schedule to the point that we see a lot of commuters will actually go home with a different person they came to work with that same day. And that actually allows people to have a lot more uh, opportunity to carpool, whereas historically, if you had to go home with the same person you came to work with every day or you have to go home at the same time every day, that rigidity made it much more difficult for people to carpool. So tell me a little bit about the story about how this came to Detroit and and why the Detroit market. Sure. So Detroit was was a natural place for us uh, for us at Scoop to focus. If you think about the history of Detroit, it's such a rich a rich history of uh, automotive and mobility innovation. And as I think about Detroit, even over the last five to ten years, uh, the amount of innovation taking place and revitalization, especially in the downtown area. It's really inspiring. And in many ways, Detroit is even quickly becoming a a tech hub for the Midwest in terms of innovation, especially around mobility. And so when we were thinking about markets that we wanted to focus on off the West Coast, Detroit felt like a natural fit for those reasons. And also because we found a great uh, partner, a great first customer in Bedrock and the Bedrock family of companies. And Bedrock is really invested in quality of life in the area. They're investing in what it means to continue to build you know, a great footprint in downtown and to do that in a way that's sustainable from a congestion perspective uh, as the city continues to grow and develop. And so we're very proud to bring Scoop to Detroit and we're proud to do it in partnership with Bedrock. All right, Jer, interesting interview. Um, I can't help but think that, you know, if we had, you know, working, uh, vibrant mass transit in the Detroit area, we wouldn't need services like this so much. Totally the same. I I hate to say it, but as these kind of projects roll out and I see these things come to fruition, my hopes around a regional comprehensive mass transit solution just continue to dim anywhere but the Woodward Corridor. I get why they're doing it. They need to solve their problems right now. They have a bunch of employees. They don't have enough room to park them. They need to make this happen. But on a greater scale, it, I think this kind of thing, if, if this really takes hold, it's the kind of thing that will discourage mass transit. Potentially, but I think it'll also be a big test of uh, whether people are receptive to the idea of carpooling, which the evidence suggests there's not a lot of love for carpooling. Carpooling yes or no, hit us up, dailydetroit at gmail.com. The city of Detroit could get more than 60 new liquor licenses. Good news for all you drinkards out there. Would-be entrepreneurs have been frustrated by the lack of licenses over the years with a long waiting list. 
For background, profit margins on alcohol is where a lot of establishments actually make their money. Without the ability to serve beer or hard liquor, it's hard for a restaurant to turn a profit. The number of licenses a city has is currently tied by the state to its population. However, Detroit is becoming more of a tourist destination lately. On the other side, existing establishments are generally not too happy about the idea. We'll have links to pieces with more details in the show notes. A Detroit charter school connected to an investment fund headed by tennis star Andre Agassi is shutting down at the end of the school year. Teachers learned that the Southwest Detroit Community School was shutting down during an emergency meeting on Tuesday afternoon. Chalkbeat Detroit reports that the school opened six years ago in a new building and that founders developed a deep relationship with parents in the community. But the school was placed on a watch list last year due to poor academic performance by students amid high teacher turnover and five different principals in as many years. The management company that previously ran it also abandoned its ties with the school. It also got locked into steep rent increases per its lease with the Turner Agassi Investment Fund, which had hoped to profit off an eventual sale of the building to the school. We'll link to the full Chalkbeat story in the show notes. Another uh, kind of stomach-turning example of just the the Wild West nature of uh, regulations around charter schools in Michigan. I mean, that was an issue a couple of years ago, remember, when Duggan tried to Force through, um, you know, more strict regulations around charter schools in Michigan and only to be rebuffed by the powerful charter school lobby led by people like Dick DeVos and Betsy DeVos, our current education secretary. Not that all charter schools are evil, but we have to no. we have to look at what the underlying business model for a lot of these places are. It's very much like a McDonald's. McDonald's, the corporation doesn't make money off of the burgers. They make money off of the land leases. What's happening with a lot of these charter schools? Why is there so much lobbying influence? Well, you've got land development companies that are making money off of the land underneath the charter school. And this is a perfect example of how this can go wrong. Yeah. So with that, as always, thank you so much for listening. A quick programming note. We'll be heading up to the Mackinac Policy Conference next week. I'll be doing in-depth conversations on the big issues in Metro Detroit and Michigan. So if you have topics that are important to you, send me an email at dailydetroit at gmail.com so I can get your questions answered. And quickly, wanted to give a hearty thank you to Halima. She joined us as a member and she's helping us push Detroit's conversations forward. Thanks so much, Halima. Yes, thank you. And if you'd like to join her, become a member at patreon.com slash daily Detroit. I'm Sven Gustafson. And I'm Jer Stays. Take care of each other, and we'll see you around Detroit. You're listening to the Podcast Detroit Network. Visit www.podcastdetroit.com for more information.